Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from Hydromantis. My name is Spencer Snowling, and I'm glad that you've been able to join us for our webinar on sulfur modeling today. So uh, I have with me uh, my two colleagues who will be presenting today. So we have uh, Hydromantis President uh, Rajiv Goal. Hi, everyone. And also uh, process modeling engineer Nick Piccolo. Hey, everyone. So Rajiv and Nick will be presenting today on modeling the fate of sulfur in wastewater treatment plants using GPSX. So this is a feature that is uh, new to GPSX. There was a new library that was released in version eight. And so today's presentation uh, will be about how to take advantage of that library and all the interesting things that you can do with it. So as per usual, uh, we will be answering questions at the end of the webinar today. So in your GoToWebinar dashboard, there is a questions panel. And so feel free to enter questions into the questions panel at any point, and those will uh, become available to us here. Uh, like usual, what we'll do is we'll end uh, uh, the, the webinar with our, our live question and answer period, but feel free to enter in your questions uh, as we go along and we'll collect them up and, and answer those uh, at the end. Uh, if we don't get to your question, don't worry, we will email you with an answer afterwards. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'll pass uh, the floor over to my colleague Rajiv and he can get things going. Thank you very much, Spencer. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Um, we will be talking about modeling fate of sulfur in wastewater in plants using GPSX. So just to give you an overview of uh, the agenda and the topics that we'll be talking about is um, looking at some of the background uh, for the sulfur in wastewater. We are quite familiar with um, the carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus processes in wastewater treatment plants. We will look at why and where it could be important to include sulfur um, in the in the wastewater models. Um, we'll look at some of the sulfur transformations that are of interest to us in wastewater treatment plant, plant processes. Also, um, see some of the applications that have been um, there, the process applications which utilize um, uh, the sulfur chemistry and uh, to its own advantage, and we'll uh, touch upon a couple of processes like that. Um, I'll give you a very brief overview of Mantis 2S model. We are calling it Mantis 2S, uh, S for sulfur, and Mantis 2 is our um, original comprehensive model for carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus removal. So we'll talk about that a little bit, um, and uh, then we'll come to the more exciting part of case studies. So we have put together uh, two case studies, studies for you um, based on some of the experimental data, some of the research uh, data that we collected and um, trying to model those uh, processes uh, using the GPSX Mantis 2S model. So um, it's going to be um, pretty neat. Um, we will also have some questions at the end of the presentation and we can, uh, we can answer some of your questions. So the first slide, just uh, looking at the background, um, um, we all know sulfur is an essential element of, for all life. Uh, it is actually part of the two amino acids. Um, uh, um, so it, it basically forms, it, it, is, it can be found in every uh, plant and animal life. Uh, the other important property of sulfur is that it exhibits um, many different oxidation states. So the oxidation state of sulfur we can see from minus two to plus six. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty reactive compound. Um, but um, the compounds that we are mostly interested in our wastewater treatment systems are uh, sulfate, elemental sulfur, and hydrogen sulfide. So these are uh, some of the compounds that uh, we'll be focusing on today. And um, if we look at uh, the sources of uh, sulfur in wastewater, uh, typically you will see that uh, in the industrial wastewater, we can find very high concentrations of sulfur either as a sulfate or hydrogen sulfide. Um, there are some other industries where uh, we can also see uh, quite a large presence of uh, sulfate. Um, in the portable water, when we're talking about drinking water, if the sources of drinking water involves groundwater, 
um, then it is it is likely that there might be some sulfate that might be present um, in the in the wastewater. Um, the other places um, that we are looking at <clears throat> involves, for example, uses of seawater or uh, intrusion of seawater into freshwater bodies uh, that can elevate the concentration of sulfur or sulfate in, in water and that can find its way into the wastewater treatment plants. So if we look at uh, the, the sulfate concentration, the typical sulfate concentration in the municipal uh, wastewater. And again, it's very, very site specific. Uh, it probably depends on the sources of the water. Um, and, uh, uh, but typically we can expect um, uh, sulfate to be in the range of 220 to 250 milligrams sulfate per liter, which is equivalent to almost uh, uh, probably about six to 100 milligrams sulfate sulfur, so in terms of sulfur. Um, so in certain situations, it may or may not be uh, important to include uh, the complete um, transformations of uh, sulfur in uh, wastewater treatment plants, but uh, depending on the processes, um, it may affect, depending on the processes and the concentration, it may affect uh, some of the performance of the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, another source of sulfate that we normally see in the municipal wastewater treatment systems is the direct addition of um, alum, so which could be basically, uh, uh, which is a sulfate compound, aluminum sulfate, and which could add some sulfate into uh, the water. On the industrial side, the concentration of sulfate could be, uh, could be much higher uh, depending on the industry that we are talking about. Some of the typical concentrations for pulp and paper, mining and chemical industries, uh, we, have, uh, we, have, uh, we have noted there, uh, but again, these are hugely highly variable on the, on the treatment processes or the manufacturing processes that are utilized at each industry. On the sulfide side, we see uh, presence of sulfide in uh, municipal wastewater, um, because of some of the septicity in the sewers or some of the um, uh, some of the anaerobic conditions that might exist in the sewer system. So typically the concentrations are not too much, but we can still expect in the range of 0 0.1 to 10 milligram per liter of uh, S2S. And again, it really depends on um, the nature of the collection system, um, whether, um, whether, whether there are pockets of um, anaerobic uh, um, anaerobic uh, domains in the uh, anaerobic region in the collection system, and how long the sewer, how long the uh, wastewater is staying in the sewer. Um, so, so depending on all of those conditions, uh, the, the, the concentrations of sulfide uh, could be quite different. Um, again, we see uh, depending on the industry, there could be a, a significant amount of sulfide concentration that we can see in oil and gas, uh, coal gasifications. And um, these are essentially uh, from degas uh, desulfurization processes. Uh, some of the sulfide can be uh, become ultimately becomes part of the wastewater at these sites. So if we look at uh, the sulfur sources, essentially we can uh, see that the sulfur is uh, uh, present in the fossil fuels. And when the fossil fuels are um, when the fossil fuels are um, essentially uh, mined and they are um, used for energy energy generation, uh, some part of that sulfur essentially finds its way into the environment, in the water environment, and ultimately becomes part of the wastewater. Also due to, um, due to the sulfur dioxide emissions from these um, energy sources, uh, we can see some acid rain and the sulfate becoming part of the water and ultimately uh, ultimately becoming, um, getting its way into the water supplies or the wastewater systems. Um, so uh, we essentially are interested in some of the, um, some of the processes that we see in nature. Um, and those uh, processes are related to um, um, sulfur oxidation. So organic sulfur, sulfur can get hydrolyzed or um, degraded to H2S and it can then be aerobically oxidized to either elemental sulfur or sulfite and then sulfate. We, can, we also see that um, 
th there are autotrophic bacteria that can work, that can utilize H2S under anoxic conditions, and they can do denitrification. So H2S can become as a source of energy for um, those autotrophic uh, bacteria. Uh, the other part of, uh, uh, of, the, of the sulfur transformation is the reductive reactions uh, using either sulfate under anaerobic conditions. In the presence of organic carbon, we can expect sulfate to be reduced to hydrogen sulfide. So this process can take place. Uh, so there are different type of bacteria which can either use sulfate, sulfite, or elemental sulfur. Uh, in addition to all of this, we also see that the hydrogen sulfide that is being produced in the systems um, could also be precipitated as metal sulfide. So we are familiar with iron precipitation and uh, other heavy metal precipitates that the sulfur can form uh, with those metals. So these are some of the, this is not a extensive list of the processes, but these are some of the key processes that are generally could be important in wastewater treatment plants when we are going through anaerobic and aerobic cycles. So if we look at sulfate reduction and we see what is the effect of sulfate, if the sulfate is present in anaerobic digesters, typically we, uh, typically the processes uh, under anaerobic digestion in the absence of sulfate, uh, we can see that uh, the large organic macromolecules, they can get hydrolyzed, get converted into amino acids, sugars, and long chain fatty acids. And um, those, those um, simple, simple, simple compounds can get then fermented into um, long chain fatty acids, uh, which can then get further degraded into acetate, hydrogen, and ultimately to methane. So um, in the absence of sulfate, we can see that all of the carbon that flows from the top to the bottom has a chance to get, uh, or, or there, there is a, uh, all of the organic compound has a chance to go through this methanogenesis process and ultimately lead us to a formation of methane. But in the presence of sulfate, um, uh, the sulfate radiant bacteria can actually interact um, in the system and can feed on all of these intermediary compounds and uh, reduce sulfate to um, hydrogen sulfide. So in this process, the use of the carbon compounds actually leads to reduction of the methane potential that we normally expect from anaerobic digestions. So typically sulfate, sulfate reduction that happens under anaerobic conditions, it uses the organic electron donor to produce sulfide and uh, uh, it can compete with fermenters and acetogens, and it can deplete the organic substrate for methanogens and produce sulfide. So essentially, these are uh, sulfate-reducing bacteria uh, can highly compete for the for the organic compounds and use it preferentially um, and uh, to convert sulfate to uh, and use sulfate as electron acceptor and uh, give us uh, hydrogen sulfide production of hydrogen sulfide. So hydrogen sulfide is um, kind of is the key problem that we can observe in our wastewater treatment plants uh, due to sulfate reduction or as part of uh, the sulfide presence in the in the wastewater that is coming into the wastewater. So typical uh, problems that we can normally observe is with respect to order uh, corrosion and um, safety hazards uh, is, a, is a big issue depending on the concentration of hydrogen sulfide sometimes it can lead to um, death of a, of a personal so it is a very uh, very very toxic compound um, also we can um, also see that if there is a presence of hydrogen sulfide it can interfere with other processes other biological processes because it exhibit uh, toxicity. Um, it can also, uh, as I said, precipitate with um, iron or heavy metals and can lead to solid deposition. Um, uh, and the most important part when we are talking about anaerobic digester is that uh, the presence of S2S in biogas, it reduces its, its, its value and we need to remove hydrogen sulfide before it can be used for any further energy recovery option. Um, the other two parts are uh, uh, the hydrogen sulfide also has been linked to uh, sludge bulking. 
uh, especially the Theotrix and Pigia toa. Uh, those are the two uh, species of bacteria that we normally uh, see related to sludge bulking due to hydrogen sulfide. And um, the other part is that once we have residual aqueous sulfide, it actually leads to an increase in the COD concentration, basically because it's a, it's a reductive compound and it actually interferes or it can capture in the COD measurements. Uh, the other part of uh, having hydrogen sulfide in wastewater is um, that it, it, it can consume, it requires uh, some oxygen for oxidation, or it can consume some um, and uh, some nitrate or nitrite compound for denitrification. So, so those are the changes that we can expect in our uh, treatment systems. So, um, so just to highlight a couple of processes, I talked about some of the negative impacts of hydrogen sulfide, but having hydrogen sulfide in a system could also be used in a beneficial way. And this is one of the process that we um, are looking at here, which is uh, named as SANI process. And it's acronym for sulfate reduction, autotrophic denitrification, nitrification integrated. So, which means that there are three different type of reactions that are synergetically working together. Um, so in this case, um, the, the heterotrophic sulfate reduction, so sulfate um, is getting reduced and um, which produces sulfide, and then sulfide is getting used up for uh, denitrifying, basically. So it gets converted to sulfate, and um, the nitrate gets uh, reduced to um, N2. So essentially, there are three reactions uh, of heterotrophic sulfate reduction, autotrophic denitrification, and autotrophic nitrification that are working together to produce um, a kind of a well-balanced system. So the sulfate in this system essentially is coming from using uh, the seawater. I'm assuming that it's coming from the seawater used for the toilet flushing. So essentially it contributes a lot of sulfate and to reduce that sulfate and use it in an efficient way, uh, this, is a, this is a process that has been experimented. So the benefits of this process um, that have been reported are reduced uh, plant footprint and reduced sludge production because um, um, we are doing autotrophic denitrification in this one. So apparently the sludge yields are much lower than heterotrophic denitrification. Um, a similar process, which is uh, essentially utilizes the same thing, but it is a attached growth process. And in this case, it is utilizing um, uh, sulfur oxidizing bacteria here uh, for the uh, for the denitrification process. So in this particular case, uh, this paper is suggesting that there are two type of SOBs that are um, utilizing hydrogen sulfide and converting into elemental sulfur. And elemental sulfur is then converted into sulfate and the nitrates are reduced to nitrogen gas. So this is again another process or an application of Sulfur, reduce, uh, sulfur oxidizing bacteria and sulfur reducing bacteria to get a, uh, to 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 create a create a good process. So um, after this introduction, just to highlight uh, what we have in GPSX now, as Spencer mentioned early on, um, since version eight, we have included um, a sulf a library called Mantis 2S library which includes the transformation of sulfur in, um, in, in, in our model. Um, so just to highlight, basically we have Mantis 2 model, which most of you are familiar with. This is a model that can be used for doing carbon nitrogen phosphorus removal. Um, it does not include sulfur, um, but it is, a, it, is, it is a model which is uh, pretty much applicable to quite a large number of municipal wastewater treatment plant situations. Um, but at the same time, uh, so we wanted to keep this model as it is so that uh, people can use this without, um, if they don't have sulfur in their wastewater, they can keep on using this one. But, uh, but as we did with our other library, which is the Mantis 3 library, which is a carbon footprint library, which uses the framework of Mantis 2 library, but it does involve um, the nitrous oxide production during denitrification and estimation of greenhouse gas estimation from different unit processes and ultimately uh, providing you with the total carbon footprint of um, the operational uh, of the process of, 
uh, of the processes that are there in a wastewater treatment plant. Um, we use the similar principle to develop this Mantis 2S library uh, by extending the structure of Mantis 2S model and including sulfur oxidation and the reduction reactions. And, um, and in addition to sulfur oxidation and reduction, this library also uh, includes uh, selenium biological reactions. So if uh, some of you are interested in modeling biological selenium removal from industrial wastewater, then this library also has the chemistry of selenium removal as well. In addition to three, these three libraries, we also, as uh, we have discussed before, uh, we have also added a couple of other libraries. One is a Mantis IW library, which is uh, stable for petrochemical uh, wastewaters, and Mantis PW, which is more like a uh, process water and the drinking water treatment uh, processes. So you can check out uh, the details of this library if you have some interest in some other libraries. But today, uh, I'm going to just talk about Mantis 2S and try to uh, show you very briefly what are the reactions that we have included in this particular model. So uh, just to highlight, basically, these are the reactions that we have uh, included in the in the in the model to start with. This may not be the complete uh, chain of reactions, but it essentially captures most of the details that we wanted to model. Uh, so we have uh, four different type of compounds um, in our model. One is uh, S2S, elemental sulfur, sulfite, and sulfate. And we have uh, two type of precipitates, iron sulfide and metal sulfide, heavy metal sulfide. And the heavy metal sulfide is any type of generic uh, metal that you can use in the system. Uh, we have uh, aerobic oxidation reaction under the presence of uh, oxygen. Uh, we have a direct reaction from H2S to sulfate, uh, which is an oxy oxidation, which actually result in denitrification. Um, uh, we also have included uh, one reaction from sulfate to hydrogen sulfide uh, for um, for uh, for producing H2S under anaerobic conditions. So to model uh, this uh, process, we have to include four soluble states, uh, which are listed here. Uh, we have eight particular states, which includes five biomass types and three, pres three um, two, two precipitates and elemental sulfur is uh, kind of counted as a particular state. And we have 16 processes. So just to kind of give you an idea, what are the processes that we have in the model? Um, we have uh, uh, processes which are related to sulfate reducing reactions. And these reactions are adapted from uh, the paper by um, ACMUS, uh, Professor ACMUS group, uh, published in 2010. Um, and it provides uh, some of the kinetics and the stoichiometric deta details of um, the sulfur reducing bacteria under anaerobic conditions. So, um, so quite a lot of uh, uh, reactions are adapted from that paper. Uh, so we have growth of uh, four type of uh, bacteria here, and uh, we also have uh, some of the decay processes that are associated with sulfur reducing bacteria. For the sulfur oxidizing reactions, we have the aerobic growth on uh, different substrates, H2S, elemental sulfur, and sulfite. And we also have the anoxic growth of sulfur oxidizing bacteria on H2S uh, during denitrification and the decay reactions are included. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also do the chemical precipitation, as I said, with the heavy metal and iron and the gas liquid transfer of H2S uh, dependent on the pH is also included in this particular model. So uh, with that, I think I would like to pass it on to uh, Nick uh, to show you some of the example cases that we have modeled uh, using the sulfur library um, um, uh, and, and and some of the outputs that we have generated from those. So um, over to you, Nick. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to present uh, two brief case studies um, along with some demonstrations just to show the capabilities of the Mantis 2S library in GPSX for modeling the sulfur oxidation and reduction processes. Uh, so first, I'm gonna demonstrate the sounding process in GPSX, which includes both uh, sulfate reducing and sulfur oxidizing reactions, as Rajiv explained. Uh, and then I'm gonna demonstrate modeling some lab scale anaerobic BMP tests uh, with varying concentrations of sulfate added 
And in both cases, I'll just show the capability of the model for accurately representing the sulfur reactions. All right, so getting into the Sony study, um, we actually found a paper which describes the operation of a large scale plant for treating wastewater uh, using the Sony process in Hong Kong. And this paper was very ideal for the model verification purpose as it includes a complete physical and operational description of the plant, as well as a lot of data on the wastewater composition throughout the various stages of the treatment train. Um, so here we have the uh, plant layout uh, described in the paper. Uh, the Sony section of the layout is uh, shown here in red. Um, and this layout contains an anaerobic sulfate reducing upflow sludge blanket reactor uh, where the sulfate reducing bacteria will then uh, produce sulfide. That's followed by an anoxic MBBR. That, uh, uh, the sulfide is utilized there um, for autotrophic denitrification and nitrogen removal. And then that's followed by the aerobic MBBR for ammonia removal uh, that includes a nitrate recycle back to the anoxic tank. All right, so I'm just gonna switch over now to GPSX to show you how we actually implemented this layout in the software. Um, so this is the Sony layout. And you can see here that we have, um, um, actually first here, just I'll show you that the, uh, I've selected the sulfur and selenium library from the uh, library selection. So we, uh, the default library is Mantis 2. So if you do want to model, model with sulfur and selenium, you're gonna have to select the sulfur and selenium library when you uh, start building your layout. Um, so you can see uh, now just on the layout, uh, process scheme here. Uh, the, we have the influent raw wastewater coming in. So this was obviously made with the input parameters from that paper. Then I have the sulfate reducing upflow sludge blanket reactor, which was modeled um, as an anaerobic tank in series with the solid separator. And that's followed by the anoxic and aerobic MDBRs for the autotrophic denitrification and ammonia removal. So now switching over to the simulation mode, I'll just quickly run the simulation. Um, and here on the uh, influent panel, you can see that uh, we actually do have the sun soluble sulfide sulfur and some sulfate sulfur in the influent. Uh, this data was all taken from that paper, as I said. Um, all right, so the simulation is uh, done running here. So this is just a brief, um, brief effluent output panel here, just with some brief description of some of the characteristics of the effluent. So this gray uh, column here shows the um, actual treatment plant data from the paper. And this white column is what the model predicted. As you can see, a lot of the values are very close. They're all very close. Some of them are um, almost right on, like the total COD and ammonia nitrogen. Um, so yeah, the model does a very good job actually predicting or just uh, predicting all the different reactions in this funny process. Um, I also have these different tabs here, uh, which I've set up with some profiles of the different sulfur and nitrogen components in the plant. Um, so the data is shown for raw influent, and then the anaerobic, anoxic, and aerobic effluents. And I just thought this was a very convenient way to present the data. It lets us get a very um, easy to visualize and understand picture, basically, of the different uh, fates of the sulfur and nitrogen in the treatment plant. Um, for example, you can see here on the sulfide profile, the model is performing as we would expect. Um, the sulfide is being produced in the anaerobic zone here, and then subsequently being used for the autotrophic denitrification in the anoxic zone. I'm not going to go through the rest of the profiles here because, as I mentioned earlier, we, ac we actually have the actual plant data for all these locations in the plant as it was provided in the paper. So I exported this data from GPSX uh, into Excel so that I could plot it uh, nicely versus the actual plant data. I'm going to go back to the slideshow now and just show you that. So um, these uh, graphs are on the fate of nitrogen in the treatment train. So the graphs here are ammonia, nitrate, and then total nitrogen. Um, it shows the same data that I was just showing in GPSX. Uh, so the influent data and then the anaerobic, anoxic, and aerobic effluent data. What we can see is that um, obviously the model predictions are matching very well with the measured data for all the intermediate streams. Um, you can see most of the nitrogen is in the form of ammonia in the influent and in the anaerobic tank. And then in the anoxic tank, uh, where the denitrification is occurring, the total nitrogen and ammonia concentrations decrease significantly, uh, because that's where the nitrogen gas is obviously being released. And then in the aerobic tank, uh, we have the ammonia being converted to nitrate. So you see a bit more nitrate there, um, because that's getting recycled back to the anoxic zone. So 
basically the high accuracy of the model of the model predictions for the intermediate streams just kind of highlights the uh, value that this modeling has. Because in many modeling projects, we're really only provided influent and effluent data. So having a model that reliably produces good predictions for all the intermediate streams um, is invaluable because it just gives us a general sense of confidence in the overall model. And it's also very valuable for determining sources and causes of, of different process upsets at different points in the treatment train. <clears throat> Okay, so um, this is now the sulfate results. Um, so it's the same kind of thing, the uh, anaerobic zone, the anoxic zone, and the aerobic zone. Now for this sulfate, sulfide, and total sulfur. Um, so again, we can see that the model predictions match very well. In the anaerobic tank, sulfate-reducing bacteria reduce sulfate to sulfide, and you can see that by the higher level of sulfide in the anaerobic tank. And then in the anoxic tank, all that sulfide is subsequently used um, for the autotrophic denitrification. So uh, clearly the activity of the sulfate reducing and sulfur oxidizing bacteria is modeled um, and captured accurately um, in the GPSX model. And yeah, as I said before, the high accuracy that the model is using to predict intermediate processes just gives us confidence when using the model. Okay, so that basically concludes the first case study on the SANI process. What we saw was that the Mantis 2S model modeled the SANI process reliably. And the activity of the sulfur oxidizers and the sulfate reducers was also modeled accurately. We also saw from this demonstration that it was evident that our simplified model structure is sufficient and allows for predictions of all the important sulfur species in the wastewater treatment train. Okay, so this is the second case study. Um, focuses solely on sulfate reduction in anaerobic digestion. So I actually built model layouts using the Mantis 2S library to model experimental data I collected during my master's studies. Uh, so first I'll get a bit of a background on the actual experiments. So I performed BMP tests with elevated sulfate concentrations. And for those who don't know, BMP tests are biochemical methane potential tests and they're anaerobic tests for testing the biodegradability of substrates by combining substrate and seed and sealed bottles and then measuring the methane production over about 15 to 30 days usually. So in this case, um, I just used a uniform substrate and just varied the sulfate concentrations to investigate how sulfate affected the process. So uh, the goals of the study were basically just to quantify the impact of the sulfate reduction and sulfide production on the anaerobic digestion and methane production, and also to evaluate the degree of the methane loss with the activated sulfate reducing bacteria, because we um, basically know that sulfate reducing bacteria are expected to outcompete methanogens for organic substrate. And obviously this is undesirable because it reduces the biogas and methane production. Uh, so we wanted to quantify this methane loss experimentally, as well as evaluate if the model predictions of the methane loss with the added sulfate are similar to our real life experimental data. So as I said, just the method was we collected substrate and seed sludge from a local wastewater treatment plant and combined them with different sulfate concentrations in the bottles and then just measured the biogas production over the course of the test and measure the biogas composition as well. All right, so as I said, we did use GPSX in the Mantis 2S library uh, to model this. So we did this because we felt the model predictions can offer a deeper insight into the process dynamics and the, also complement the experimental results. And it also offered us a good opportunity to see how well the Mantis 2S library uh, could model the anaerobic batch tests. Um, so as the lab data was limited and the model initial conditions usually require much more data than what we can measure in the lab, we used a systematic modeling approach to fill in the initial condition gaps. So what I mean by initial condition gaps is that we didn't have certain important data for kinetic modeling, such as the initial concentrations of the various types of biomass. And this is because getting an accurate estimation for each type of biomass in the lab or in the field is very difficult, especially for anaerobic tests. It's not as simple as just measuring the VSS and then using that as a heterotroph concentration, as it's common to do with simple activated sludge models, because in anaerobic tests, there are many types of bacteria and archaea, such as fermenters, acetogens, methanogens, and sulfate reducers. So you can't just use a VSS number and just say that's the biomass concentration. So instead, I actually used this systematic modeling approach um, here to get the biomass characterization. So first, what I did is I modeled a simple activated sludge process. Uh, with operating parameters similar to the local waste water treatment plant that we collected the WAS from to produce WAS with similar characteristics to that substrate sludge. I then modeled an anaerobic digester with operating parameters similar to the digester that we got the seed from 
uh, to produce uh, a seed sludge with similar characteristics. Um, and then I used those detailed character characterizations that the model provided me um, as the inputs into the BMP test models. Um, I'm currently actually writing a paper that explains this process in more detail and the results of the experiments and uh, a more detailed look also at the additional insights that the model can provide us. And I will uh, hopefully complete it soon and then I'll be able to share it with all of you. Um, so now, moving along, I'll just switch to GPSX for a quick desktop demonstration of this model as well. Okay, so as you can see, I have these four different batch reactors shown here, um, all with um, the same organic and biomass influence, but with different initial sulfate doses that can be seen up here on the input panel. Uh, so I just use an input file to feed the reactors a pulse of substrate at the beginning of the test, and then it's run as a batch test from there on out. So I'll get right into showing some results. So here uh, we can see the methane production results. Uh, the discrete points on these graphs are the um, lab data imported into GPSX, and then the, um, the lines are the model predictions. You can see that the model predictions do track the lab data very closely. And you can also see um, the methane production is reduced uh, in both the lab data and in the model as the sulfate concentration increases. So the no sulfate obviously has the highest methane production, and then here in the highest sulfate dose, you can see the lowest methane production. Uh, they also, the curves show a reduced a slope of methane production at the beginning as the, um, as the sulfate concentration increases, um, which indicates uh, a reduced activity of methanogens compared to the sulfate reducing bacteria, which is something else we have expected to see. Um, and obviously the strong agreement is very valuable. The methane uh, production data bring so well with the lab data is very valuable because um, having a reliable prediction for the amount and purity of product of gas is obviously very important when you're trying to design an anaerobic digestion process. Um, now, um, BMP tests are supposed to be run as undisturbed batch tests because trying to take a sample of the sludge during the test is very difficult to do without jeopardizing the anaerobic condition. So having a model like this that can predict certain things that we were unable to measure because we didn't want to disturb the test is actually um, very interesting. So we can have a good degree of confidence in the predictions knowing that methane production results uh, line up like this. We can look at other things um, we weren't able to measure such as the uh, microbial growth. So here I have the microbial growth results and it kind of offers insight into what was happening on a microbial level during the experiments. Um, so I have uh, the zero sulfate, the low sulfate, the mid sulfate and the high sulfate doses. And um, this light blue line on each of the graphs represents the uh, sulfate concentration in each bottle. Um, so looking more at the zero sulfate case here, um, we can see uh, the green and pink lines are the acetoclastic and hydrogen trophic methanogens. Um, and then the other lines here at, uh, are obviously very lower at zero are the sulfate reducers. And since there was no sulfate in this test, obviously this is exactly what we would have expected. Uh, looking at the low sulfate case, um, you can see some growth of the sulfate reducers now. We also see um, that the hydrogenotrophic methanogens at uh, one point in the test are actually unable to compete with the hydrogen utilizing sulfate reducing bacteria and their growth is kind of stalled right around this region over here until all the sulfate is consumed. And then looking at the um, high sulfate case, um, we can see that the growth of both types of methanogens is basically uh, completely stopped for a short period of time just due to the fact that the higher sulfate concentrations allowed such a rapid growth of the sulfate reducing bacteria um, which have higher growth rates and higher affinities for organic substrates, and it basically just stopped the methanogen growth completely. Uh, these results, uh, so meaning the uh, sulfate-reducing bac bacteria out-competing the methanogens, are what we generally expect based on our previous knowledge of uh, sulfate-reducing bacteria and methanogen competition. But the model uh, serves as an additional tool for our analysis because it allows us to visualize and analyze the competition and get more like of a detailed idea of what's actually happening. Um, the specific competition between all the different groups of microorganisms for the different types of substrate. All right, so now I'm just going to switch back to the slideshow uh, briefly to show um, one more way um, that the, uh, or I guess, another powerful predictive feature of the model. So here, um, this figure shows the experimental and stoichiometric expectations for the CO2 production in the BMP tests. 
And it also shows the model predictions of the CO2 production when the model is implemented in two different ways, uh, two different ways that I'll explain uh, briefly. First, uh, some background on the um, on uh, just the CO2 production. Uh, stoichiometrically, we expect that sulfate reduction uh, should produce much more CO2 than methanogenesis for the same amount of organic substrate. And you can see that with the dashed line on the graph. Um, as the sulfate concentrations increase, uh, you can see the predict or the stoichiometric expectation for the C2 production is also increasing. But what I actually observed in these experiments was the exact opposite. Increasing the sulfate dosage led to a decrease in the CO2 production. Um, and you can see this uh, in the experimental data on the figure that are represented by the diamond shapes. Um, now, we believe this is because of the effect of sulfide production on alkalinity and the bicarbonate buffering system. Uh, so you can see the bicarbonate buffering system equation given here on the slide. So when sulfide is produced from sulfate, uh, H plus ions are actually consumed and the equilibrium shifts to the right, which causes more CO2 to stay in solution than if no sulfide was produced. And this effect of, uh, on pH and gas transfer isn't always easy to accurately model because there are lots of factors that can affect pH, especially in wastewater and high solid systems. However, GPSX uh, does a very good job modeling this. Um, so in GPSX, there's two options to deal with pH. The first is a very simple option. The user just sets a pH at a constant value. And the second option is to turn on pH calculation, which then considers the acid-base chemistry and the alkalinity in the bicarbonate buffer system um, and just more um, acid-base um, reactions. Um, so what we can see on the figure is that when we turn the pH calculation off, the model predicts a similar trend in CO2 production as the stoichiometric expectation. However, when we turn the calculator on and the buffering system is actually considered by the model, the CO2 or the model predictions, I should say, for the CO2 production closely resemble the observed experimental data. And this result is uh, really interesting and quite great because it just displays the accuracy and the high quality of uh, the pH calculation uh, in GPSX and the, also the gas liquid transfer reactions, which are aspects of wastewater treatment that can typically be quite difficult uh, to model accurately. All right, so that brings me to the end of the second case study. Uh, so we saw that the sulfate reduction is well described using the Mantis 2S model structure. And this was very evident from the strong agreement between the lab data and the model predicted data. Uh, we also discussed how the model predictions can be used to complement the experimental data when you use a careful approach to model building. And we saw the value of the model's ability to give uh, reasonable predictions of the um, microorganism competition. And finally, we saw the sulfide chemistry and interactions um, with the bicarbonate buffering system is actually captured very accurately in the model as well. And this was evidenced by the model's excellent prediction of the CO2 production. All right, so now just um, kind of brings us to the end of the main presentation portion of the webinar. So to summarize what we discussed, uh, sulfur can be found in many forms in the environment and the sulfur cycle is quite complex. Uh, therefore, modeling sulfur in wastewater is important. Um, and the most appropriate applied treatment processes can vary a lot depending on the form and concentration of influent sulfur species. Uh, we also found that the model structure we currently have implemented in GPSX is able to accurately predict the fate of important sulfur species in water resource recovery facilities. Um, and it's also able to predict how the presence of sulfur is gonna affect other biological processes and microorganisms due to a competition with the sulfur bacteria. And lastly, the uh, model also, uh, the Mantis 2S model also includes uh, selenium remo removal and is available as a standard module in GPSX. All right, uh, thank you very much for listening. We hope you found the presentation informative and interesting.